revive and revamp the oil and gas uh, industry in the country. And we are currently being joined by Chief Madaki or Madachi Ame, who is an oil and gas expert and managing partner BBH Consulting. You're very much welcome to the studio, sir. Thank you very much. Well, uh, before I come back to you uh, to get your take on this, we'll also be joined virtually by President of the Ijo Youth Council, Dr. Alaye Tari Theophilos, who will be joining us to share his thoughts with us considering the fact that he is um, a major player or resident in a region of the country uh, that has been rocked by some of these uh, economic and fuel crises. Well, coming back to you, uh, Asa, let's uh, let me get your take, uh, Chief Madaki. Firstly, the nation has been thrown into yet another fuel crisis. People are anxious. People are angry. Motorists are demanding for the sack of the NNPCL GMD Mele Kerry, who has been in power for almost or the, at the hem of affairs of the NNPCL for almost a decade. What would you say is causing all of this crisis? bedeviling the nation in terms of, of uh, petroleum products? Well, uh, thanks very much. Um, the challenge in the oil and gas sector in Nigeria can just be reduced to one phrase, you know, poor management, yes, sir. incompetence. You know, um, nobody can deny the fact anymore that, you know, the way the sector is being run in this country has actually been shameful over the years, you know, for decades now. Yes. You know, our refineries are always been turned around or in the process of being turned around for the past 30 to 35 years. So, you know, what the circle has been is that, you know, anytime a new GMD comes, he sets a target for when the refineries will function because he knows it's a hot topic. Yes. And those targets are usually set uh, to coincide with when their tenure is about to expire. To expire. So what they are saying in the sort in a subtle way is, well, you guys don't bother us until we are done, you know. So, and when when they set that target and everybody begins to announce or expect, you know, that target, you know, nothing is done anymore. You go to sleep, you know, and it's the same rambling on and on and on. A lot of money is spent. The last figure we had was 1.5 billion US dollars to turn around the Port Harcourt refinery, you know. It's water under the bridge. Every time they give us new targets, you know. Just passes. And, uh -huh, and then the target date just passes as if nothing happened. You know, the last of those targets was August of 2024, when we were told that the protocol refinery that should have been turned around by now will start, you know, producing. Yes. So, you know, what we see in the sector is that because Nigeria lacks a process of consequence management, where people who who perform poorly actually get punished for their poor performance or incompetence. You know, people just run around and give excuses for their inability to perform. And and and, and it, it, it appears like, uh, as opposed to that, here in Nigeria, mediocrity is being awarded, is being rewarded. We celebrate it because if if in the last nine years of holding down the hem of affairs at the NNPCL. Mele Kerry and his cohorts have not been able to get one single refinery out of four working. Don't you think that perhaps, just maybe, it is time for him to let go? Yeah, and, and, and allow other people, other competent hands to come into the picture and play their part as well? Yeah, clearly. Um, the president reappointed him as group managing, uh, group the, CEO of NMPCL, of CEO, yes. you know, not long ago. And then a board that you know, you can't really see who will make a difference on that board. You get the point. Chairman of the board is a very old man, you know, and the 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 challenge is that, you know, the oil and gas industry needs to be to be managed in a more competent and efficient way. Yes. You know, we're not seeing it and it's becoming very embarrassing, you know, for this country. So I agree with you, you know, that when people are not performing, when people are not performing, they're supposed to be changed out. Yes. You know, and in fact, when someone stays too long in a particular position, it becomes a nuisance, you know, because that sense of comfort, that sense of, you know, untouchability, 
you know, become... Uh, to, 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 they become too relaxed exactly, in the system. Exactly. Well, well, I'm going to come back to you, uh, uh, Chief Madaki, but let me head over to uh, Dr. Alaye Tari, uh, who I believe would also be joining us in the next uh, couple of minutes to share his thoughts on the program. But coming back to you, uh, in the news this morning, there was a report that for the next quarter of 2024, which is the fourth quarter of the year, NNPCL will be needing about 6.6 .6 trillion naira to import PMS for just the 6.6 uh, .6 billion naira, I beg your pardon, to, in, to import PMS for the remainder of the year. What, 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 how would you react to this? Well, I think the figure will be more like 6.6. .6 uh, trillion. Tr tr because, trillion naira. Yeah, yes, okay, because okay. 6.6 .6 billion is a small amount of it money. It is a small know, amount for, of money you know, for, for NNPCL, yeah, yes. Exactly. And, um, you know, you have, I'm sure you're also aware that NNPC has admitted, you know, reluctantly, the, after the initial denials, that they actually owe 6.6 .6 billion six, US six, dollars. 6.8 billion US dollars. Yes, exactly, on, uh, on back supplies. And that the oil traders are no longer agreeing to sell uh, PMS to them. Yes, they've admitted that that's actually responsible for the long queues. Uh -huh. You know, unlike um, their usual deniers that you know that there, there hiccups at the uh, depots and all that. Yes. So you know, Nigerians should brace up for a fairly lengthy, um, excruciating for scarcity, for scarcity situation. and uh, black marketeering and uh, you know excessive prices at the pump. You know, I saw um, a picture of an NNPC outlet this morning yes. that uh, is already displaying 855 naira per Amazing. liter of PMS. What that means, may, it may well be an official recognition of the fact that the prices have gone up and that you can no longer get it at 6 and, 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 and local marketers might be selling for prices uh, for up to a thousand. Uh, for, up to a thousand course, or a thousand something. Uh, exactly. So... We are in for a period of further belt tightening in an environment where people are not earning new money. Yes. You know, so this is what poverty is about. So you have to spend more money than you than you earn. Yes. On on products that you cannot avoid. Because if you have to put fuel in your car, you know, you have to wrap the country has to keep moving. The only way we can move right now in the in the complete if to, uh, total absence of public uh, uh, transportation systems yes. is to continue to fuel our cars or fuel the buses, you know, the few buses that are on the road. So, how are you going to expect that prices to come down? How are you going to expect that people will be able to earn a livelihood that actually takes them, uh, you know, uh, to the end of the month or even to the middle of the month? So, we're going to see excruciating poverty. We're going to see, you know, people's, um, you know, standards of living crash even further. And, you know, I don't understand the economic model that this government is running, but it seems to be tightening the news on the necks of Nigerians on a day-by-day -day basis, you know, while, you know, making their own lives comfortable, you know, on a day-by-day -day basis. Because they are not complaining, you know, they still run in their, in their convoys in, in of, their of, convoys, of, of, of hundreds their, of vehicles. Their offices still exactly. run on, on, on power gener on this, generators exactly. and all of that. So they are, not, they are not really feeling the brunt of what the ordinary Nigerian out there on the street is feeling business owners on the street small office owners who well because of this uh, electricity situation in the country as well would require generators mm. to power their offices they will also require p uh, petrol or uh, diesel to be able to power their their uh, uh, generators Precisely. in in looking for alternative means of powering cars in the country if you recall, the federal government brought about the issue of CNG buses that they were going to roll out to states and all. And, and just this morning, we saw that or your state is set to deploy 20 CNG buses given to them by the federal government. Now, this is an alternative route away from petrol powered vehicles. And the federal government itself is also encouraging individuals to convert their vehicles to CNG powered vehicles because the prices of petrol is not coming down anytime soon. Is this solution what Nigerians really need at the moment? Well, we don't really know um, what the government strategy on this is. Yes. You know, I think that the CNG 
conversion should have happened much earlier than this. Yes. You know, I don't know why, you know, we've been talking about CNG for well over five, you know, to seven years. And up to now, we do not see the CNG conversion centers all, uh, all over the place. The NMPC had said that they were going to um, reduce the... They know that they were going to re that they reduce their investment in Dangote refinery yes. in order to fund to use the, the money saved from there to fund uh, CNG conversion centers across the country. Yes. I've not started seeing those conversion centers. You know there are a few signboards of CNG whatever. Where I think you know if you go into those places and you say you want to convert your cars, they're not going to. Uh, see anybody that will be able to attend to you. But, but do these CNG conversion kits come cheap? How how affordable and how accessible are they to Nigerians? That is the point. That is the point. Because if the government really wants a step change from petrol to CNG, then they have to be prepared to subsidize the cost of uh, of of conversion. Yes. The last time I heard, you know, the the few centers that do it, you know, the price comes to anything between four hundred and five hundred thousand. Uh, you know, to just do a conversion. Yes. You know, and why would anybody want to spend that extra money? Well, and, and they could easily just buy petrol. Exactly. And then the point that we must always make is that petrol, diesel, kerosene on their own are not bad products. They are products that will continue to be with us for a very long time. But the way the government is demonizing petrol now, as if, you know, it's actually a bad thing to drive a petrol car, it's where I get, you know, where I think they're getting it completely wrong. If we run the economics properly, even at today's exchange rate, which is outrageous, at you know, with all the current circumstances that we have on hand, yes, a liter of petrol should not cost more than three hundred naira exactly in this country. Yes, because the pricing mechanism for petrol and all the other products at the pump is completely wrong. You can't be an oil producer uh, and then you are buying the, the crude oil from yourself at an artificial price determined by the international market. It doesn't work that way. What should have happened and what ought to happen here is that the quantity of crude oil that is required for local refining, for local consumption, should be priced at the wellhead cost. If you do that and you price at the wellhead cost, you will not get into the kind of quagmire that we are at the moment. It doesn't cost more than $10 to produce a barrel of crude oil, no matter how inefficiently you try to run it. Well, well, I've seen figures of $48 per barrel, but in Nigeria, everything is padded. It's padded. And because nobody is really supervising what the IOCs are doing and the producers are doing, anybody can come up with any kind of pricing. But it's very, very, it's completely outrageous to say that you're producing, uh, you know, a natural flowing well, you know, that's already, um, uh, that, that, that pumps itself. You know, without the aid of much of of of, of much, artificial much pumps, efforts. you know, and then I hear you are telling me it's forty-eight dollars to just fill a, a one drum, you know, two hundred uh, one hundred and ninety-five uh, on the average uh, liters of, uh, of 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 crude oil inside the drum, and then you say it's, 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 it's forty-eight dollars to you know how, what what does that mean? Well, well, well these, these comments that you've just made and these these uh, analysis and and takes that you have given sort of call for a a more and better check and balance of the NNPCL in itself because it appears that it's running as an independent body there is no uh, supervision whatsoever by re other relevant stakeholders to ensure that the runnings of the NNPC is checkmated well i, I would want you to group ceo of uh, NNPCL and all however uh, recently dangote refinery made a statement saying that only NNPCL will be allowed to buy petroleum products, refined petroleum products from it. And, and other bodies are agitating this decision by the NNPCL. How would you react to this? Yes, I read the same report, you know, that um, Dangote is finally beginning to put their, about to put their PMS uh, on the market. Yes. And what has happened basically is that you know, all of this while, you know, since they started test production, they've been producing uh, Jet A1, uh, that's the aviation fuel. They've also been producing uh, diesel, you know. But even though the whole production uh, line is supposed to bring out all the products at the same time, but for some reason, they've not um, been producing uh, PMS. Yes. Now they want to start producing PMS, and I read um, this morning that NMPC will be buying the entire stock of their PMS for now, obviously because of the huge PMS market in the country yes. and to also wriggle out of the challenge that they have 
you know, with um, international uh, oil traders who are no longer selling, uh, uh, willing to sell uh, PMS to them because of all the huge debts, you know, amounting to 6.8 uh, billion US dollars yes. that, that, that they currently owe. So it's a huge challenge, yes. you know, and it would be good if, um, if, yes, sir. if it would be good if NMPC finds a way of ensuring that the market is supplied because we're talking energy security here. You know, if there is no PMS for a prolonged period and nobody knows where to buy it from, you know, it's going to lead to, it's going to be the first of its type of situation that we have ever faced. And considering that most of the vehicles in Nigeria, even the, uh, you know, uh, the electric power supply also results in a lot of people running their petrol generators, it's going to lead to a crisis. All right. So well, if Dangote is come, stepping in, you know, to help solve that problem at this time, then... Uh, they should be thankful, you know, that there is an alternative. And now, now, now remember the, the scuffle between Nangote refineries, the NNPCL and the MD, NMDPRA that happened about a month ago or so. Never in, in, in a very, very long time did Nigerians think they would be buying petrol at such outrageous prices. How did we get here? How did we get down to this hole that we are currently in as a nation? Well, again, incompetence and short-term planning. You know, and when you talk of the Niger Delta, a region that I'm very familiar with because I used to work for Shell Petroleum, yes. you know, for a prolonged period. Okay. Um, it's very pathetic. You know, one of the indices of performance that the military reports lately is how many uh, illegal refineries, illegal in quote refineries they have destroyed. Over a period they of time, cover and destroy. Yeah, and when we had this, you know, last week there was it was all over the news, uh, newspapers, you know, that they had destroyed well over two hundred of such outlets, you know. Yes. Apart from the environmental disaster that this uh, portends for the Niger Delta, you are also, you know, emasculating the young people who, in spite of the fact that they have their their degrees and are skilled in in the sector have nothing to do. It's your duty as a government to provide a means of livelihood for your citizenry. But here you are, because you are unable to play that role, they you drive young means. people into that level of desperation where they begin to criminalize their activities and then they steal crude oil from the pipes and then they find a way of refining it and now you go destroy those uh, you know, so-called illegal refineries. When you should be dissipating that, you know, you should be exerting that energy in fighting Boko Haram and the bandits, you know, and, and you know, terrorists that, that in, 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 the, in the North, in the northwestern uh, region. In different parts of this country now. You get the point. So I think that's misplaced priority, misplaced aggression. My solution is that, you know, instead of having the current scenario where people are paying up to 3,000, you know, Naira for a single liter of petrol, you know, in, right there in the Niger Delta where the crude oil is produced. What the government should do is to set this uh, artisanal refiners up into cooperative societies, set up modular refineries for them. You know, this thing is not rocket science. Give them access to crude oil legitimately and let them refine for the local, let them refine for the local, uh, you know, market around where they, 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 uh, they operate. If you do that, all parts of the country will be adequately uh, resourced. Yes. But they're not doing this at the moment. They are, you know, criminalizing activities that ought not to be made criminal. Instead of bringing them out from the closet and then integrating them into the legitimate economy. I mean, yeah. j j just like it happened with the Niger Delta militants exactly. who, who were pardoned and, you know, uh, some sort of amnesty was granted to them. And now all the menace of militants in the Niger Delta... Has and been gone under, exactly, oh. exactly. This is what to do. You know, but why government keeps the grandstanding about things that they cannot control is what still beat, beats the hollow. And I think that, you know, we should have a holistic approach to the resolution of issues, you know, in the Niger Delta and in other parts of the country. We've had insurgency in the north, you know, and government has been, um, you know, trying to battle it. And they also offered amnesty to people who you know, uh, laid out their arms, you know, even when they committed heinous crimes, you know, and all of that. So why would you be seeing an artisanal refiner, you know, as a criminal, when you actually should be saying this man is trying uh, to... As a potential 
uh, worker that could be exactly. utilized for, for, for a better good. Exactly. So set them up into cooperative sites, allocate crude to them, let them buy the crude in Naira legitimately, give them credit terms, you know, link them up with the Bank of Industry and let them begin to legitimately earn a living. You know, but here we are, you know. The politicians who do next to nothing and all the money, you know, collect all the money in this country. And those who are really, you know, supposed to be taken care of are not taken care of and nobody seems to care. Well, the issue of pollution, environmental hazard in the Niger Delta has been one that has spanned decades. People have lost their lives in the fight for, you know, the cleanup of the Niger Delta. People like the late Ken Sarawiwa and the rest. They are, the, the story has just been quite an unfortunate one considering that the region is the region where our oil is situated yet their environment is polluted they don't get prices uh, uh, pms at the prices as other uh, parts of the country they buy it at a more expensive price how can we create a balanced system where the niger delta is properly compensated for the woes that they are facing due to oil exploration in that region? Well, I think that, you know, again, in the usual feeble manner, the government tried to address this by setting up the Niger Delta Development Commission yes. and then also by setting up the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs. But we don't see anything tangible coming from those organizations. Year in, year out, the budget, huge sums of money, the money disappears. You know, there's always one scandal or the other riding on the back of each other, you know, competing for attention in the media. Yes. You know, and, you know, the solution still lies with having a focused approach and getting people to do the right things and then punishing those who are unable to do it well, you know, and who are caught with their hands in the pie, clearly. But here we are, you know, those who steal the most are the, mo the ones that are most celebrated in this country. They ride roughshod over the average citizen and nothing happens. You know, so, you know, criminality and grandstanding about how much wealth they have made from criminality seems to be the order of the day. And, you know, when you are running a lawless uh, country the way we are right now, you know, then those who are conforming, you know, to the law or trying to be, trying their best to be good citizens oh. are seen as the aberration. Uh, yes. And it becomes a very, very frustrating situation, I can tell you. Well, well it's still speaking of aberration and people who want to, um, you know, adhere to the rules and guidelines laid out to properly operate in a system like Nigeria. I earlier mentioned the rift, a triangular rift between the NNPCL, the NMDPRA and the Angote refinery uh, recently, which led to a lot of revelations being made, the Malta refineries that were spoken about. And uh, if, if you followed the news, I believe you remember how everything played out. And yet again, uh, we, some people, some analysts are of the opinion that what the NNPCL couldn't do in decades, the Angote refinery came and did in just a very short while. Yet, they are being faced with a lot of backlash by the government-owned agency. Why are we here? Well, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But the reality of Maybe. it is that, you know, bad news doesn't make headlines anymore in this country. Yes. You know, and when they do, you just give it a few days and then it fizzles out because worse news will come and overtake what you thought was the worst that had been heard. Ordinarily, there should be a national outreach around the Malta uh, revelation. blending, yes, revelation. There should be a national outreach about, you know, how, you know, just about how everything is wrong in this country. But, you know, Nigerians have become complacent. They have become used to bad news, you know, and then, you know, they carry their strain on their faces on a daily basis, you know, waiting for that next you know, government policy that would drive them deeper Crazy. and further into poverty. <laughs> you know, so, yes, I hear you. It's not, it's just completely outrageous for uh, operators to be quarreling openly with the regulator yes. and accusing uh, the regulator of licensing uh, companies that bring in adulterated, uh, you yes. know, diesel mm. and petro other petroleum products. And I say, come on, this is not right. You know, why would uh, an, an organization like Dangote make such very heinous allegations? You know, but they probably also have their facts, you know, but like all things Nigerian, they've been swept, 
you know, we are, we are overwhelmed by bad news. And that outrage, which should have led to a massive national probe that will probably bring out some form of, uh, yeah, you know, truth about the whole it's of the situation. just quietly swept under the carpet. swept under the carpet, and the story is no longer news. You start talking about it now, you know, you're just, uh, you know, shouting at the... At, 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 the, a brick at, the, at the brick wall, you know, and wasting your time. Well, so well that's where we are. Well, 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 let's hope, like, let's hope that stronger voices uh, spring up and speak against some of these irregularities in the system. Because as it stands, Nigerians are day by day growing more and more impatient. I hear you completely. What? Well, what? Well, and, and you know, part of what we was hoping, you know, with the president, uh, the current president that we have, you know, Tinubu. Yes who has some form of oil and gas background, having worked in mobile at some executive level. You know, we were expecting that we were going to see some of that experience you know, and background translate into the way the oil and gas industry is managed, especially because he still retains the position of Minister of Petroleum. I must also tell you that I'm sure you're aware that Nigeria has not fared so well with privatizations. You know, it's good for government not to be in business because they never get to manage uh, business as well. Yes. You know, but it's not a silver bullet. You know, a lot more needs to be done, you know, to ensure that when you do privatize, those who take over the majority shares are not just the motley crowd, you know, owning just like a few thousand shares, you know, in a big behemoth, you know, like an NPC. It has to be that the core investors have the technical know-how to run the organization, you know, transform it into a transparent and competently run organization. Yes. We don't see that in the, on the radar screen. So we should not, you know, import another inefficiency, you know, into an already very inefficient arrangement. So it needs to be studied more closely so that the, the, the model that is run, that is adopted, will be the one that delivers the best. You know, it's not happening. Oh, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Madaki or Madachi Ame. I must uh, appreciate you for giving us your time and your wealth of experience uh, on the program.